This episode is sponsored by CuriosityStream. More to come on that shortly. So, Crofty, it's been a bit of a wild week of research, hasn't it? Wild is definitely one word for it. I'd go with tiring. <laughs> yes, tiring and a little anxiety-inducing, I've got to say, folks. Uh, we are here today to talk about a subject which is more controversial than we expected. Let's put it that way. Yeah, we thought this was going to be an easy episode. We were wrong. <laughs> yep. Thought it was going to be an easy short episode and uh, we're off to the races instead it may be the longest standalone episode that we do there's no good way to split this one in half so uh, uh let's just muddle through and hope for the best hello everybody my name is charles uh, i'm here today with my uh pet demon sidekick crofty <laughs> and we're here to talk to you about some myths welcome to mythological hello Today's episode is a curious subject. Um, I ended up kind of revealing this a little bit over on my on the YouTube community tab over on the Histocrat channel, um, and I talked a bit about it on Twitter as well. And it's been giving us some difficulties in terms of the research. We had a lot of problems with sources for this one, and we had a big body of myths to summarise. So, without any further ado, Crofty, would you like to reveal today's topic? Yes, today's topic is the Wild Hunt. Mm. Vilda Jagd, or uh, Jagd, or however it's supposed to be pronounced. And that's our first mispronunciation of the day. <laughs> yes, there's going to be plenty of them, folks, because there's a lot of German words going to be in this particular episode, mm. as it is primarily seen as a Germanic myth. Or is it? Dun, dun, dun. Yes, that's going to be uh, a little bit of the journey of this particular episode is how Germanic is the wild hunt. And we'll get into that. And how mythological is the wild hunt? Exactly. Are we unfortunately just dealing with pure folklore? We'll have to wait and see. So Crofty, I'm going to start us out on the right track by saying, what was your previous familiarity with the wild hunt? Well, it's quite a common trope in fiction. I'm sure Quite a lot of people listening will have heard of it in various forms. I in particular knew it from Jim Butcher's Dresden Files series, where it was led by an elf with the title of Earl King, which comes from Van Goeth's poem, The Earl King. I also knew of it from the Warhammer universe, where the Wood Elves army had the Wild Hunters of Kernuos, and I knew... What well, I thought I knew, some of the mythology surrounding it and how some of the mythology developed and discovered in the past few weeks that I was a little bit wrong. Hmm. Well, for my, uh, for my two shakes, my uh, previous knowledge of this was almost entirely limited to a, just a generic knowledge of this myth that it is a myth out there. When I, going into this, I thought that this was like a proto-Indo-European myth that had shown up repeatedly throughout European history. And I think, unfortunately, today we're going to be challenging that idea quite a bit. In terms of my pop cultural knowledge of this, I was probably most familiar with this motif from the aptly named The Witcher Free Wild Hunt, which features the main villains as a procession of spiritual uh, horsemen who do indeed ride through the night, and in this case they are a group of elves. But other than that, I didn't have probably the same fictional basis as you, Crofty. I'd actually forgotten about the Wood Elves example that you gave there, but hopefully I have managed to adequately enlighten myself in order to discuss it today. Crofty, do you want to start out, for those at home who are not previously familiar with the Wild Hunt and its general form, by giving us a little bit of a definition? Yes. So the term as we interpret it was coined by Jacob Grimm in a section of his book, The Deutsche Mythology, which collected a variety of myths and folklore from Germany dating back several centuries. To give a bit of context to this, Jacob Grimm 
Well, he's most well known, perhaps, for his collaboration with his brother on Grimm's Fairy Tales. He was also a respected folklorist, a respected legal scholar, and a scholar of linguistics, um, in which much of his work concerned finding ways of un- unifying the history of Germany. So finding the origins of the various Germanic languages, finding a unified origin for various forms of Germanic folklore, and also studying the history of the legal systems of various German states, which culminated in a brief career in politics, where he was part of the first attempt at a united German parliament, the Frankfurt Parliament, in 1848, as he was quite a strong supporter of a unified Germany, which will become quite relevant when Charles goes into detail on him later on. Yeah. So the way that he defined the Wild Hunt was that it was a host of otherworldly riders, generally heard before they're seen and recognisable by the thunderous cacophony of hooves, the barking of monstrous hounds, the cries of hunting horns, all of which were louder and much more terrifying than any mortal hunting party could create. And this was mostly seen and heard throughout November and December, associated with the winter solstice, and also associated with the blurring of barriers between the mortal world and the other world. And so in many traditions, it was also seen as heralding a change of seasons. The leader of the hunt, Jacob Grimm, specified that the leader was Odin, but did also suggest that other traditions had other leaders, generally a god or a dead hero, who were usually associated with the crossing over of the dead. And the host itself can be made up of a combination of spirits of the dead, spectral hounds, elves, fairies, demons, practitioners of magic who are using a form of spirit projection, and mortals who've been swept up in the frenzy. There are a few related terms that I'm going to briefly define as well um, that have been used by mythographers and folklorists in more recent times. One particular one is the furious host, which tends to refer to a host of dead knights or warriors, which are often determined to engage in a battle. The infernal hunt or infernal host, which refers to Christianized depictions, which specify the host as being from hell or being from a form of purgatory. We might also be using terms such as spirit procession, which tend to be used when describing hosts that will share a lot of aspects of the wild hunt or of the furious host, but will be passing peacefully and may even speak to onlookers. And we'll also be mentioning a phenomenon called the witch's sabbath, in which the spiritual host is made up entirely of witches projecting a double of themselves while their body remains in their bed, which is similar to what we would call astral projection. And they would be roaming abroad at night, led by usually a pagan goddess of magic. I don't think I missed anything there, Charles, unless you've got anything to add. No, what I really then have to add going off that was the question that hangs around a lot of Grimm's construct, as Crofty just defined it, of the Wild Hunt and of the various umbrella traditions that it holds, is how consistent was it with the idea of a single belief, as Jacob Grimm himself argued? So his argument was very much, as you said before, that the Wild Hunt consisted of a single belief that likely stemmed from a pre-Christian era. The unfortunate reality in the course of doing our research is I think we came to disagree with this concept, Crofty. We honestly, from what I've seen in terms of evidence and interpretation, I feel like Jacob Grimm's definition of the Wild Hunt is really the birth of the Wild Hunt in this kind of collated, cohesive form. And that the origins of its actual definition really rely on a selective reinterpretation of quite a wide variety of different traditions. I'm inclined to agree with you there, as the listeners will be finding out over the course of the episode. Okay, Crofty, before we get into the problems surrounding the construct of the Wild Hunt, as defined by Jacob Grimm, I just want to take a moment to talk about this episode's sponsor. So this episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream. Curiosity Stream is an affordable subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including its own exclusive original series. I've recently been watching through their series, The Nile, 5,000 Years of History, 
which tracks the critical role the river played in the development of ancient Egyptian society. You'll learn about how the Nile shaped day-to-day -day life for ordinary Egyptians throughout the last five millennia, and influenced their understanding both of the wider world and the afterlife. I'm currently exploring making a video myself on one of the lesser-known periods of Egyptian history, so this was the perfect thing to get myself in the mindset. And if ancient Egypt isn't your thing, Curiosity Stream covers a wide range of other content on topics such as history, science, technology, music and sports that can be easily streamed to a device of your choosing. So go to curiositystream.com slash the histocrat or click on the link in the description below to get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries for under $20 a year. That's just $1.67 a month. And with the promo code histocrat, you can save another 25% off your purchase. So try Curiosity Stream today. So I think it would be valuable for us to briefly talk about where Jacob Grimm was coming from in the way he formulated his mythology. So as Crofty mentioned beforehand, many of the claims and interpretations of myths and folklore that he collected and presented in Deutsche Mythologie seem to have been very much shaped by his own preoccupation with Germany's national borders. And there seems to be some evidence that he was attempting to create, as you said, very much a unified mythology for the Germanic and Scandinavian peoples of Northern Europe. This worked very much in line with his kind of political concerns and his political sympathies with the leading question within Germany of the day, which were the question of lesser Germany or greater Germany being formed as a cohesive political unit. So what this refers to is lesser Germany in the form of the eventual German Empire that was created in the 1870s, which consisted of the then state of Prussia combined with the other German states, but not including Austria, which itself was a large multinational empire, which included territory in places like Hungary, southern Poland, modern Romania, you know, Austria, what is now the Czech Republic. And ultimately, as I said, this question would be resolved in favour of lesser Germany. Jacob Grimm was very much in favour of Greater Germany, as shown by his involvement with the Frankfurt Parliament. As a result of these various sympathies, he considered the job of much of his folk to, as I said, to establish a unified mythology for the Germanic peoples. There are also some problems of his methodology, so for a start he tended to consider reported folklore as having an antiquity greater than that of available medieval and early modern texts. And the reason for this was really was that he just didn't believe that the kind of common folk were capable of altering the practices that they inherited from in earlier periods. And they very much continued to use these rituals without really comprehending their meaning. And Crofty, the comparison I would give here, which is a bit more of a light-hearted comparison, is if you look at the development of fan fiction on the <laughs> internet, you will learn how very much untrue that idea is that a pre-existing belief or practice when given to a particular human community, will stay frozen in time and used without much knowledge of its origins. Yeah, I would also add to that that if he was correct on that, a lot of our previous episodes would be much shorter. Yes. Particularly Dragons, Yokai, and I don't think we'd have a spring Heeled Jack episode at all. Yeah, I think uh, King Arthur falls under that as well, as we saw with all the reinterpretations that happened over the centuries. Hmm. So he also, his interpretation of what ancient religion looked like is very much out of step of our knowledge of what a lot of pre-Christian religions actually looked like. So in 19th century, a lot of uh, thought regarding pagan religions was that they were primarily concerned and based around fertility rites and rituals, which if you looked at any ancient religion is a patently false statement. Like many ancient religions, including those of ancient Rome, Greece, Norse mythology, etc., those did have festivals and rites that were definitely associated with fertility, but they did not form anywhere near the single thread of those particular belief systems and ways of looking at the world. Yeah, I think a lot of uh, rites surrounding death and ancestors would also be another major thread of those kind of older religions that Grimm seems to ignore. Yeah. So I think it's best for us to say that, in summary, Grimm's work was highly influential and he should be lauded for bringing together a basic body of associated folklore. But it should be seen in the light of the problems that we have raised 
and many of his more exact concerns and claims regarding the origins of certain legends are a lot more suspect. And most scholars that talk about the Wild Hunt have thrown out a lot of his claims as a result. However, two major assumptions of the methodology that he used seem to have remained fairly constant within the various pieces of literature that I looked at on this subject. And we, there's a reason that, unlike some previous episodes, we haven't yet given our sources, and it's probably because we need to discuss problems with some of these sources as they come up. But don't worry, we are, we are getting to it. So those two major assumptions that have kind of remained within the literature are that the various forms associated with his wild hunt construct were derived from a single untarnished pre-Christian belief, and that this belief then either diversified during the Christian era or was actively demonized. And then the second point was that folklore recorded in more recent times can be used to augment and interpret information from genuinely ancient and medieval sources, even if there are no intervening sources that show any degree of continuity between these periods. And um, I think you can, for some of these sources you can also show you can also add geographical separation between the two as well without any evidence being shown of continuity between those locations yeah those issues will certainly come up when i get onto the british variations of the wild hunt later on so up until recently this interpretation of the wild hunt myth as being a pre-christian uh, mythology has been the predominant one as discussed by folklorists such as Catherine briggs Carlo Ginsberg and Eva Pox. Often this discussion took the form of a possible linkage between these pre-Christian popular beliefs and early modern ideas associated with witchcraft that Crofty kind of touched on when he was defining various terms. And it quite frequently contains assertions that the Wild Hunt was one of those kind of Indo-European wide traditions that we have discussed in various forms in previous episodes, particularly in the Dragons episode where we talked about the idea of the recurring motive of a storm god or a hero of some type contending with a serpent within various Indo-European cultures. And this kind of uh, tradition has continued right up until recently. The most recent major articulation of the theory was in the form of uh, Claude Lecouteau. How do I pronounce that? I've been going with Lecouteau. Lecouteau. I could be wrong. Lecouteau. Lecouteau might be another possible one there. Uh, the work is called Phantom Armies of the Night, The Wild Hunt and the Ghostly Processions of the Undead, um, which I would describe as a useful but highly disorganized catalogue of the various ghostly traditions of Europe. And this very much comes down on the side that I've mentioned beforehand, that this wild hunt uh, myth and construct that we really identify as coming from Jacob Grimm was a cohesive whole in earlier times. In the second half of the 20th century, however, it seems like a small number of scholars really started to push back against this. It first started in kind of a limited way amongst authors such as Gustav Hengsen, Wolfgang Beringer, and uh, John Claude Schmidt, um, who largely noted that there was a paucity of textual evidence that directly connected the full construct of the nocturnal procession back to ancient times. However, I think several of those authors either then went on to say, however, the antiquity of this myth is clear, even if there is a paucity of evidence, uh, or I think one of them also recanted that position as well. Probably the most well-known refutation of this idea in the last 10 years has been that of the historian and folklorist Ronald Hutton, who is probably known for his wide range of various writings since the 1990s on all aspects of pagan uh, traditions or beliefs within Europe. I knew him best from his book on Druids, which I used to inform my video on the subject on the Histocrat channel, which was Blood and Mistletoe. And I would describe Ronald Hudson as someone who is sympathetic towards man many pagan beliefs and new uh, neo-pagan beliefs out there currently, but he is also a historian and he is willing to be critical and point out lack of evidence. And in a 2014 article titled The Wild Hunt and the Witch's Sabbath, and also in a section of his book in 2017, The Witch, he has argued that the modern understanding and idea of the wild hunt is largely just an amalgamation of a varied body of hunt-related myths, and that there is no clear textual evidence that shows a single myth with all of these component parts prior to Jacob Grimm. 
He further asserts that with the possible exception of some components of an element that we will get into, which is uh, a more female-based spirit procession that Crofty hinted on in his definitions, there is little in the way of any direct evidence that any of the traditions within the umbrella of the Wild Hunt are truly pre-Christian in origin. In fact, it may be plausible that the development of many of the traditions that later would be amalgamated into the Wild Hunt may actually have come, come about and been spread into popular consciousness by the church wishing to demonize some local traditions. In fact, many of these traditions that we have in terms of textual evidence are only really known of first from church denunciations. Sort of the original, is it the Streisand effect? Yes. Where you try and uh, suppress something and instead make it much more widespread. Possibly. Um, that in itself is something of a theory rather than a certainty, but it fits the mm. evidence that I've seen presented a little better than the claims of a single belief that was diversified in Christian times. So to, before we go any further, folks, I really want to lay my cards on the table and say that I am not obviously a linguist, I am not a folklorist by any means, and many of the authors that we discussed before and have better knowledge of the actual first-hand sources. I'm also handicapped by the fact that many of the sources are published in German, and I do not speak German, and some of them are just difficult to access at all. However, in my role and knowledge of history, and as someone who kind of prides himself on inquiry and working from evidence, I personally am more inclined to side with Hutton's argument that the Wild Hunt is really a construct that was pulled together from a wide range of folkloric traditions by Jacob Grimm. I'm also inclined to um, side with Ronald Hutton on this one. Hmm. So with our positions kind of put on the table there, I want to say that what I'm really going to be devoting my section to, and I think Crofty as well, we're going to be simply discussing the various wide strands and categories of mythology and folklore throughout Europe, which can conceivably come under the umbrella term of wild hunt or wild hunt related, just to give you folks a sense of the different folklore traditions that we personally feel were probably amalgamated later on. But there's definitely some worthwhile and useful folklore in there. For my sections, I just want to quickly say that I am going to be using, as I mentioned before, Ronald Hutton's article and his section of the book The Witch. I'm also going to be referring back to Lekker Show's uh, work, Phantom Armies of the Night, because whilst I disagree with many of the conclusions he, play he presents and the examinations that he includes in that book, the first-hand sources of some of the folklore I think is really useful and genuinely interesting. So I have used some sections on that, particularly when I'm going to be discussing the Wild Hunt Association with Odin. Right, Crofty, so I think it's fair to say that of the various traditions that later came under the umbrella term of the Wild Hunt, there are kind of two major strands and one minor strand. The major strands are the procession of the marching dead as a single tradition by itself, and the separate female-led spirit procession, that, as you mentioned before, is usually led by a goddess figure from a pre-Christian religion, or a mythological figure, or even a biblical figure. The minor strand that's kind of been added into this as well, there are also quite a few different folklore traditions around just a tradition of a single spectral huntsman. So, for example, uh, Claude Le Lekashow kind of demonstrated that there was three major guises of this. So one is as a wandering demon who is seeking out sinners. One is as a human huntsman, who is condemned for his sins to hunt without rest. And then finally, as a wild man, who is instead chasing a human or a supernatural prey. This final thread is quite disparate in nature. There doesn't seem to be a obvious evolution and origin point, as best we can tell, for this. So we're going to kind of treat that one on a case-by-case -case basis when we come to talking about individual regional figures and traditions associated with the wild hunt. Before then, we're going to start by looking kind of at the historical development of the two major strands that we mentioned beforehand. Mm -hmm. So the first of these is what is termed the processions of the marching dead. So it has been known from at least Roman and Greek times that the night generally has been considered a time in which otherworldly elements were more prevalent. In addition to this, we have things like scattered reports of ghostly armies seen on ancient battlefields or as portents of coming events. However, there is no clear evidence 
of any major accounts of wandering armies of the dead that seem to date from Roman and Greek times. And that was a conclusion that was largely led to by the scholar Carlo Ginsberg. In fact, there are even some quotes from early Christian era Roman authors, uh, for example, the author Tertullian, that specifically condemn that this belief uh, is relevant. Although I will point out that the fact that he's had to condemn it probably indicates that some people at the time did believe this. So his quote is in relation to the works of Homer, and it comes from his work De Anima. To quote him, It was believed that the unburied dead were not admitted into the infernal regions before they had received a proper sepulture, as in the case of Homer's Patroclus, who earnestly asked for a burial of Achilles in a dream, on the ground that he could not enter Hades through any other portal, since the souls of the sepulchered dead kept thrusting him away. He then goes on to say that they also say that those souls which are taken away by a premature death wander about hither and thither until they have completed the residue of the years which they have lived through, had it not been for their untimely fate. Now either their days are appointed to all men severally, and if so appointed I cannot suppose them capable of being shortened, or if, notwithstanding such an appointment, they may be shortened by the will of God or some powerful influence, then I say such shortening is of no validity, and they still may be accomplished in some other way. So similar to the lack of any clear evidence for processions of the wandering dead coming from Greek and Roman accounts, we similarly lack any such beliefs from Northern Europe within this period, with one minor exception that I'll get into. A lot of this may stem from the fact that there is almost a complete lack of indigenous written accounts during this era, and any future claims that have been claimed that there were particular belief structures active during this time, I will say are largely based on back projection from later accounts and folklore. So the one exception that we have which has occasionally been linked to the Wild Hunt is a second-hand report that comes to us from the Roman author Tacitus, who is best known for being the son-in-law of the Roman general Agricola, who completed the conquest of Britain, and I believe also produced the works The Histories and The Annals. This quote from him, however, comes from his work on the tribes of Germania, and it concerns a Germanic tribe known as the Harry. I'll find my quote here. So this is him discussing people who are native to the region of Swabia, and he says, I need only give the names of the most powerful, the Harry, the Helvicons, the Manimi, the Helisi, and the Naharanavari, and the Nahanaravali. Wow, that one's hard. In the territory of the Nahan, oh, I had to say it again, didn't he? In the territory of the Nahan Aravali, there is shown to be a grove hallowed from ancient times. The presiding priest dresses like a woman, but the gods in Latin translation are Castor and Pollux. That expresses the power of the divine presence. Their actual name is Alci. There are no images, no trace of foreign superstition, but they are certainly worshipped as young men and brothers. As for the Harry, they are superior in strength to the other peoples I have just mentioned savage as they are, and they enhance their innate ferocity by trickery and timing. They blacken their shields and stain their bodies, and choose pitch-black knights for their battles. The shadowy horror of this ghostly army inspires a mortal panic, for no enemy can stand so strange and devilish a sight. Defeat in battle always begins with the eyes. So that particular quote has been interpreted by many later authors as associated with an early belief in the Wild Hunt, I think it's important to point out, however, that that at no point involves a procession of the spectral dead. It is simply a case of human warriors using a particular tactic to mimic spirits. So that is essentially the closest textual evidence we have for any sort of wild hunt uh, being present in Northern Europe in Roman times. And I think we have to agree, Crofted, that is pretty slim as evidence goes. Mm, I'd say so. As we move to the early medieval period, we do have a small smattering of accounts of the wandering dead. So uh, probably the most notable I found is that of the 6th century Byzantine historian Procopius, who reported secondhand again, like Tacitus, that there was a myth that comes from the northwest coast of Gaul, which I assume means Brittany or the region below, that invisible companies of the dead were shipped by the local peoples across to Britain en route to the afterlife. Much like Tacitus, they said, 
Procopius never ventured as far as Gaul, so we're uncertain as to how much this is actually a genuine traditional belief local to the region. It may be something that was reported to him spuriously. The one thing I'll point out as well that these are invisible companies of the dead. To the best of my knowledge, they're not associated with the night or any specific time of the year, as the later Wild Hunt is, as shown by in Crofty's definition. As we reach kind of the 11th and 12th century, however, this is where we begin to see a fully fledged tradition of wandering, visible companies of the dead that emerge throughout France and Germany. So, briefly, this includes accounts such as that of Rudolphus Glaber of Cunny, who claimed a living monk had met a throng of Christians that had been martyred by Muslims and that they were preparing to journey to heaven. Similarly, we get an account from the Book of Visions by Otlo of St. Emiram, who recorded how a vast troop was seen in the sky by two brothers. After crossing themselves for protection, they asked the troop who they are. One of the people that they're talking to discloses to them that he is in fact their father, who has been actively punished for using someone else's property during his lifetime, and that he will only be able to find redemption if his sons return the land to its rightful owners. On a similar subject, uh, Whippert, who was the Archdeacon of Toll, writes in his life of Pope St. Leo, which I believe was pe penned approximately around 1066. Yeah. No, that's not correct. <laughs> <laughs> I just went to 1066 because it's the Norman one, which was penned approximately around 1060. There's a company of white-clad individuals were seen advancing towards the city of Nami. These individuals were seen marching in ranks from the morning until three in the afternoon, at which point they settled down. Approached by the local inhabitants, they informed them that, quote, we are souls who have not yet atoned for our sins because we are not pure enough to enter heaven. We are visiting the holy sites as penitents. I think the thing to point out there is these troops were all seen during the daytime. We again don't quite yet see this real association with the night, but our next account very much brings in that association, and it's going to be one that Crofty, I believe you've been doing a good amount of research into, and this was, to set it up, an account by a Norman monk by the name of Orderic, I believe, might be Oderic Vitalis. That's right, yes. Oderic Vitalis from the St. Everult Abbey in Lissau in Normandy. Exactly. Uh, so he was an 11th or 12th century Anglo Norman Benedictine monk who wrote a contemporary chronicle of Norman England. This account begins with the birth of Christ and I believe continues until the defeat of King Stephen of England during the English history period known as the Anarchy uh, at the Battle of Lincoln in 1141. In a section of his work that seems to date from the 1130s, he chronicles an encounter that was related to him by another Norman priest named Walchelin, who claimed to have met a host on the 1st of January 1091, whilst he was called out to tend a sick man in an outlying area of his parish. So Crofty, I believe you have a detailed description of this encounter for us. Yes, I do. So, as you said, the monk Walchelin was returning from attending to a sick parishioner who was living quite far out in the countryside. And so, walking down dark country roads, he heard the sounds of an army on the march behind him. Not sure whether this army might be hostile to him, he attempted to hide in a grove of medlar trees while they passed. However, a giant man wielding a club appeared before him, barred his way, and commanded him to stay where he was. The figure then lowered his club and stood beside him as the host passed. This host was a thousands strong procession which was separated into several groups. So the first group in the procession was a crowd on foot, many of whom Walchelin knew as recently dead villagers, and they were carrying what Vitalis describes as the possessions that make up the plunder of a raiding army. This is then followed by a group of pole bearers carrying 50 beers, as well as two men carrying a tree trunk, to which a man that Walshlin recognises as a murderer has been tied, and he is being tortured. The giant at that point joins the procession behind the pole bearers. Following this, there are a group of women riding side saddle, 
with all of their saddles covered in red hot nails that Vitalis describes as being punished for their lechery. Walshlin also recognised some empty horses and empty car- carriages as belonging to people that he knew were still alive. Following these empty horses and empty carriages, there is a group of clerics, again, some of whom Walshlin knew, and all of whom begged that he pray for their souls. Finally, a troop of knights, described as with no colours except that of darkness and flickering flame, passed. At this point, Walshlin realises that this must be the retinue of Heliquin, whom we must assume is the giant figure with the club. Yeah, I, I understand Crofty as well. There was some inter- some claims and interpretations are that this also referred like as a name to the whole group rather than one individual. Yes, yes. As, as time goes on, it seems to become unclear where the name, whether the name refers to an individual or the host. I believe in this case, Walshlin does specify that he believes Heliquin to be the giant who is leading them. Mm, fair enough. I could be mistaken in that. I could have missed missed that in my notes. Yeah, a lot of authors, uh, when I was reading it, seem to be unsure of the exact origin of the word. And it it suddenly seems to appear associated with with the particular giant figure and with the wider uh, host as well. And uh, the exact source is is some debate over that exact name, but I'm sure we'll get into that later. Yeah. The way that it's written in the story basically is written as if the reader will know who Heliquin is. Yeah, it's probably already known as a concept by this point. Yeah, just this seems to be the first written reference to the name. Hmm. So the monk intends to bring proof of what he's just seen back to the abbey. And so he, quite foolishly, attempts to seize one of the riderless horses. However, as he attempts to get into the saddle, his foot is burned by the stirrup and his heart is struck with an icy cold which is quite a common trope in various bits of folklore surrounding processions of the dead, where touching the dead both causes a feeling of cold and a physical burn. So, following this attempt at stealing a horse, four knights immediately turn back and accost Walkelin. Three of them attempt to drag him off with them into their procession as punishment for trying to steal their horses when he had not been harmed by their passing. However, a fourth knight stops them and instead requests that Walshlin pass a message on to his family and asks them to return property that he had unlawfully held as collateral for a loan and have that returned to its rightful owners. However, the priest refused to do that, citing that if he found the man's son, the man's son would never believe him, would never believe his story, and would refuse to do so, and so it's a pointless endeavour. And so the knight seizes him by the neck and attempts to strangle him. However, the monk invokes the name of Mary and another knight appears to rescue him and chases off the four. This knight reveals himself as Walshlin's brother, saying that he had recently died in England and says that he is atoning for his sins and will be released from his burden the following year. He then implores Walshlin to amend his own ways and atone for his misdeeds, of which there are many, and to not tell anyone of this event for three days, which is apparently also quite a common trope when seeing these, kind, these kinds of processions that there is a condition on when you can actually relate the story. The following morning, when Walshlin is returned, he falls ill and remains ill and feverish for a week and stays bedridden. Once he begins to recover, he then tells the bishop what occurred. The point you just mentioned of the witness to this procession falling ill is something that also happened in that account I briefly mentioned by Whippert, Archdeacon of Toul. So when they spoke to the white-clad company of individuals uh, who informed them that they were the restless dead, next day many of the individuals met with them then fell ill for a period of time. So that clearly is a, a wider trope at this point. Yeah, yes. And another wider trope that appears here Vitalis claims that he has met Welsh Lynn and claims that he has seen the burn marks on his face and neck from being attacked by the knight. And this is also a common trope as proof that the story was real. Mm. And so after declaring that he's seen this proof, 
he then uses this story as a warning against sin, warning that sinners will join this procession of the dead if they don't amend their ways. So while there's no hunt involved in this narrative, the idea of an army of ghostly knights that are doomed to roam the earth on winter nights under the leadership of this supernatural figure who is associated with the passing over the dead is quite consistent with one of the core ideas of the wild hunt that I mentioned in my initial definition. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that explanation, Crofty. I think um, one big thing to take away as well from this legend that we, we touched on before is the developed nature of the legend and the known association of the host with uh, Herlequin does seem to show that the belief in the host was likely pervasive in the region at the time. It's kind of also cited by some authors, so Ginsberg and uh, Le Cachot, both seem to regard this as the moment where the host of the dead went from a purely pagan myth to being incorporated into a Christian one. But as I've previously noted, we don't have any previous written accounts of this myth in association with other pagan beliefs. And as we've seen, many of the trappings of that story, so for example, the torment of the sinners, the urge for Walshillin to repent by his brother, and the invocation of Mary's name, they all seem to be distinctly Christian elements in the supposedly pagan story. You can argue this is the point where those Christian elements were inserted, but we don't have an earlier story to compare it to, fundamentally. Yeah, so because it's used very much to say repent for your sins, it's possible that it was an original story used as Christian propaganda. Possibly. It may have been intended to... Con- yeah, it may have been that. It may have been used in an allegorical sense. We just don't know, fundamentally. So, by the late 12th century, this legend of Herlequin's host, also known under names of Herla, Herlechin, or Helloin, appears to become quite widely attested throughout England, France, and the Rhineland. Some theory I saw from Ronald Hutton was that northern France is thought to be the epicenter due to its association with Norman monks, um, but I could not find anything further to corroborate that point. The supposedly clerical origin of these reports has also led some, such as Ronald Hutton, to suggest that this whole trope is, as we said, largely a result of Christian reporting uh, designed to discourage folks from believing in these traditions. An additional point really to note is that whilst the... It kind of contradicts our earlier point was that whilst this Herlequin's host name was known to the subject of the story, who was himself a monk, at no point is it ever stated that the common folks would know who this figure is. It may be something that a Christian monk might know, but it doesn't necessarily mean a widespread belief. In addition, whilst there was an example that you gave within the story of a leader of the host, in many of these future kind of reportings that we see throughout this period, there is not that much sign of a common leader. Um, a good exception to this is Walter Mapp's account, uh, published in the 1190s, where uh, the leader of this group is an ancient British king by the name of Herla, who uh, was doomed to roam for centuries due to a curse. But I imagine you're going to get into that a bit later. Yes, I'll be telling that story in full at a later point. But again, it should be noted this legend is found, to the best of my knowledge, nowhere outside of England and does not feature directly a host of the dead. By the 13th century, these practices spread further into places such as Spain and Germany. Um, in Germany, the very distinctive title of Das Wutend Heer, or the Furious Army, comes to be associated with this group. According to Jean-Claude Schmidt, this spread is also marked by an increasing level of suspicion and hostility by the clerical authors who report it, and the reporting of ghostly parades just generally seems to, to take on more demonic characteristics, again possibly due to it becoming more widely known within popular culture and these clerics wishing to discourage its practice or belief in it. When I say demonised, I also somewhat mean that in a literal sense as Later on in the Heliquin, uh, we start to see greater presence of demons amongst its ranks. So these tales continue on and appear in increasingly greater numbers, but largely unaltered in substance during the later Middle Ages. During this time, 
the tradition of the Mesni Heliquin kind of appears and develops and is continued to be presented in somewhat of a negative light, largely by clerical authors as a group comprised of devils that will lead people astray from a Christian life. Over time, we also start to see the association of other mythical figures with this procession in different regions. The best examples I have being a former French king by the name of Charles V, and of course, by King Arthur, who we have talked about plenty in this series. Um, so I will leave my discussions of those at that. I think, Crofty, you're going to be revisiting them a little bit later when you talk about the specific traditions of these regions. Yeah, yeah, King Arthur does briefly pop up. Um, it should also be noted that during this time, Heliquin or Heliquin increasingly starts to become a byword for scoundrel or rogue in France, as we can see uh, in some later versions of how this, these figures were understood that Crofty will be going into. And in Germany, the term Furious Army was increasingly associated with noisiness and loutishness. From the 16th century, we also start to see some more detailed references that give some sense of the common person's understanding of what these hosts would consist of. So we can still, during this time, really see two different traditions of these hosts as either being a demonic entity or as a more penitent group of the dead. So an example I have of this uh, is that in 1508, Johann Giller von Kaiserberg, which is the best name, enunciated the common people's view of the Furious Army as simply a band of regular people who had suffered violent deaths and were forced to wander the land until judgment. Throughout this period, a more time component also starts to appear to the host, as Crofty mentioned, where they start to be associated with midwinter and the periods of November and December, along with the four ember days, which appear each year in the uh, liturgical calendar of Western Christian churches. There's also an account by the Protestant theologian Johannes Agricola, who recorded how a priest near Eiselben had told him the furious army was seen annually by his parishioners at the beginning of Lent, and that it was now said to include some people who were yet living, for whom inclusion was said to be a portent and a prediction of the specific form of death that they would suffer. So that is a very generic and heavily summarised over the view of how these traditions developed up until kind of the 16th century. We're going to go into more specific details on some of these aspects later on. I'm going to conclude, however, this section by saying that by the 16th century, the various regional beliefs in these nighttime processions in places like England and France seem to be starting to fade and disappear or taking on different forms. In England, the associated term the Hurlowain slowly disappears and being reported over the course of the 15th century, and actual reports of belief amongst common folk in Heliquin vanish from France during a similar period. Mm. The exception to this really is that in Germanic folklore, these beliefs and traditions seem to have remained strong into the early modern period. And I will talk more about how these associations continued on towards the 19th century and Jacob Grimm's encounter and collation of these myths uh, in the course of me talking about the Germanic god Odin and his association with the wild hunt. If I may add, as you say about the beliefs in the Heliquin disappearing towards the 15th century, it has been suggested, I think mainly by um, Lekito, that that coincides with the rise of Protestantism as the idea of the Heliquin fits with some ideas in Catholic tradition of purgatory, whereas in Protestantism, purgatory was pretty much removed from the belief system. And so the idea of an army undergoing so many years of penitence before being able to pass on very much fell out of favour in the religious community then. Yeah, I mean, I'm not particularly familiar with the development of Protestantism with France. I'm much more familiar with its suppression later on. But so. Certainly could be the case. I don't really have any knowledge to say anything either way. So that is a very rough overview of that particular school of uh, traditions and beliefs associated with the later umbrella term of the Wild Hunt. From there, Crofty, I'm going to move on to give a similar description of the Spirits Procession. Okay. So this usually consists in varying traditions of 
a retinue of a supernatural female who may take either as her retinue spirits or even humans, predominantly living women, but there are some traditions in which it is both women and men. The one thing I want to mention is, I, and I think you'll probably go more into this, Crofty, when you talk about your various figures that you've been examining uh, along this line of the various traditions associated with the Wild Hunt, is there is perhaps more evidence of this being a more ancient tradition than the Wandering Dead concept. Yeah, it seem, seems to be that there was a tradition there that was very much co-opted by Christian writers, again, as a sort of warning against sin, by the looks of things. So I have, again, summarised this tradition in its development quite heavily. Um, it seems, in terms of the wild hunt that was later presented by Jacob Grimm, it is somewhat less of a factor than the procession of the marching dead, but it does contain a high degree of similarities and a number of figures who go on to be associated with wild hunt in future folklore. So the earliest example of this retinue I could find is given in the works of the Canon Episcopi, which is a set of canon law by an unknown author that likely comes from the 9th or 10th century. It's not 100% sure exactly where it derives from. If I may. Yes. It's like I go into that quite a bit of detail in my section, and I have it cited as being written by by Regino, the abbot of Prum, in 899. Fair enough. And the main feature of this canon law is that it denounces the supposed belief by many women that on certain nights they would ride with a goddess figure known as Diana across the world whilst they remained sleeping in their bed. So, Crofty, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes. So, the original quote that I have from the canon Episcopi, is thus. Certain wicked women, turned back to Satan, seduced by demonic illusions and phantasms, believe of themselves and profess to ride upon certain beasts in the nighttime hours with Diana, goddess of the pagan, or Herodias, and an innumerable multitude of women, and to traverse the great spaces of the earth in the silence of the dead of night, and to be subject to her laws as of a lady, and on fixed nights, be called into her service. So it doesn't explicitly mention a hunt, but the idea is very much implied when it states that the women are riding in service of Diana, who was the Roman equivalent of the Greek hunter goddess Artemis. This is later incorporated, the same text, into a text called the Decretum by the Bishop Bouchard of Worms, which was written in 1066 in which Bouchard further elaborates with the quote, Have you believed what many women, turning back to Satan, believe and affirm to be true? As you imagine in the silence of the night, when you have gone to bed and your husband lies in your bosom, that while you are in bodily form, you can go out by closed doors and are able to cross the spaces of the world with others deceived by the like error, and without visible weapons, slay persons who have been baptised and redeemed by the blood of Christ. He also later goes on to mention that these same women whose spirits have left their bodies would fly into the clouds where you have waged battle on others. And so these stories are again warning of the evils of witchcraft and paganism and do again contain several aspects of the wild hunt as mentioned earlier. So a spiritual host riding abroad during the night led by a god associated with hunting, death or the natural world engaging in hunting or killing, and doing battle in the sky. Yeah, I think Burchard also pulls in another thread that will be useful to talk about in the evolution of the spiritual host, which is an additional condemnation that he includes alongside that collection of decrees, Crofty, I believe, is of women who believe that at certain times of the year they must spread a table with food, drink, and free knives, so that if those three sisters come, I'm quoting him directly here, whom past generations and stupidity called Parsi, which uh, is a Roman word for the fates of Roman mythology, whom past generations and stupidity called Parsi, they can regale themselves, and that these sisters were then expected to provide benefits to the household in return for this provision. 
Yes, there do seem to be a few suggestions that belief that this initially came from a much more benevolent tradition. So it was suggested by William of Auvergne, the Bishop of Paris in the early 13th century, that there was a pagan belief of a host of ladies of the night who were led by a woman called either Satia or Dame Abundia. Uh, she was thought to be the Gallic variant of the Roman goddess of prosperity, Abundantia, which is where we get the word abundance from, a goddess who was also associated with the cornucopia, or the horn of plenty, which came up last episode. This version of the host of women would enter homes at night, and they would consume any food that was found in uncovered dishes and drink anything that was found in uncorked bottles. And then these vessels would all magically refill. The 13th century text, the Thesaurus Pauperum, which was attributed to the scholar Peter of Hispania, elaborates on this and claims that this visit would then bring prosperity and plenty to any household that had left open food offerings for Dame Abundia. So it would seem from other writings such as the Abbot of Prum and Bouchard of Worms and certain other Christian figures that by associating these pagan beliefs with Satan and then subverting the idea of bringing abundance and prosperity into the idea of gluttony, Christianity then attempted to subvert these beliefs and turned the benevolent witches into a kind of infernal host. Yes, certainly. And it also kind of ties together the two separate strands at that point that we just briefly mentioned beforehand of when you're talking about Bouchard of Worms account, you have these separate uh, kind of spiritual procession. Then you have the three sisters who enter a residence and partake of food and provide benefits to the household for it. Uh, it's in the 13th century that we start to see those two strands kind of be pulled together into a common tradition. Mm, yes. And uh, this same tradition also appears in the courtly poem, the Roman Della Rose. And this case, the figure that leads the host is known as Lady Ahabond, who had an entourage known as the Good Ladies, that comprised of human women whose spirits flew out of their bodies whilst they slept. And it is specifically said that as they were spirits, this host had no problem entering houses through any crack. So again, considering on from Burchard's theme there. Around the same time, Crofty, in support of what you were saying about increasing demonization of these figures, the sermons of Berthold of Regensburg uh, warns against the belief of these nighttime spirits for whom food is left. And he gives quite a range of names associated with them. He calls them the benevolent, the benevolent ones, the malevolent ones, the night women, the blessed ladies, or the ladies of the night. So there's clearly still some variety in tradition here. And you are still seeing variations where the leader of the host is still called Diana or is called Herodias or Bensosia. So, Crofty, do you want to talk a little bit about those latter two figures? Yes, because Herodias is, in fact, an entirely Christian creation. Herodias was actually the daughter of King Herod, and she was the woman who was blamed for the death of John the Baptist. Herodias was a virgin who lusted after John the Baptist and vowed to give herself to no other man. When her father, King Herod, discovered this, he ordered John the Baptist to be decapitated and ordered that the head be brought to Herodias on a platter. In her grief, she tried to embrace the head. However, John's head flew away from her and exhaled a strong wind which tore open the roof and carried Herodias into the sky, where she would be eternally tormented by St. John's anger in the form of this wind pursuing her. So a 12th century text called Isengrimus claimed that one third of humanity, which is interpreted to mean adult women, with the other two thirds being adult men and children, serves her during the second half of the night, specifically from the time that we would now call the witching hour. John of Salisbury, also in the 12th century, claims that the host of Herodias would feast and riot and carry out other rites, 
where some are punished and others rewarded for their merits. Moreover, infants are set out and appear to be cut to pieces, eaten and gluttonously stuffed into the witches' stomachs. Then, through the mercy of the witch ruler, they are returned. So, once again, bringing this association to one of gluttony and taking that the next step to the sin of cannibalism. And I believe I should hand back to you after that one. Yep, no problem. So, from this point, Crofty, where we start to see these various diversifications uh, of the leaders of this host and of the various types and forms it takes, we also see going into the kind of the high Middle Ages, these legends really spreading throughout much of Western Europe. So it now comes to include the regions of uh, kind of in England, France, Italy, and Germany. By the mid-14th century, this particular procession and the figure that is led by it has recognized would become a figure known as Perchter, or Berchten, who I'm not going to go into in great detail here. Let's just say she is a somewhat more forbidding figure than the leaders of the host have been presented up to this point, with the exception of uh, the last couple that you mentioned there, Crofty. I will talk a little bit about her when I talk about specific German myths, and a good thing to keep in your mind here is more of a comparison to someone like Baba Yaga than the ideas that we've had of this figure up to this point. In Italy, a nightly procession was reported that consisted both of living men and women, known as the Trigenda, which is again led by either Diana or Herodias. In the 15th century, descriptions continue to multiply further. I'm going kind of through a bit of a list here, I must admit, with names for the leader of this procession being those such as Habundia, Finzen, Sac Semper, and Sacria. Uh, so according to Professor Thomas von Hasselbach of Vienna in the 15th century, it was reported that Perchta was in fact an alias of Habundia. And this is where we kind of see an element of Perchta that I will go into. And it's claimed that she and the procession are active at the Feast of the Epiphany that ends the Christmas season. Hmm. So we do see a kind of a comparison that you could make potentially there with the spirits of the dead, uh, restless dead where they are kind of active in midwinter sort of period, but I'm not sure if they're ever identified as specifically being active during the Christmas season. In Germany, there also seems to become further levels of equation between these figures. Um, for example, we start to see uh, mention of figures such as a figure known as Unhold, of Frau Berfer, of Frau Helt, of Frau Holt, who is also equated to the Abundia or Satia that you mentioned that was um, given in the works of William of Auvergne. And really these stories re begin to kind of adopt something of a South German distribution in which the older tradition uh, of the female figure who would reward offerings of, gener of food with generosity was preserved despite the efforts of the church to condemn these practices. A good example of these combinations comes from a contemporary account in England in the 1400s from the homily Dives and Pauper, which condemns the practice of leaving out food and drink at New Year to feed a figure known as All Hold, who is again uh, quite easily equated with the figure of Unhold that I mentioned beforehand, who uh, would go on to kind of evolve into the figure of Holder and really be incorporated into the figure of Frau Holt, who we, I believe, discussed in the Baba Yaga episode uh, to quite an extent. Yes, I think it was actually a story that was in Grimm's Fairy Tales of mm. Frau Hall, which bore quite a lot of resemblance to a specific Baba Yaga story mm. and did cover these themes of her treating you well if you were generous to her and responding angrily if you were hostile towards her. Yeah, very much so. So, Crofty, one thing to then add on is that by the time we reach the 14th century, in addition to kind of these church chroniclers, we really start to see occasional records of these figures actually appearing in trial records um, usually in the form of testimony by people who claim to have been involved in these spiritual processions themselves so i believe you have a couple of early examples of trials in which these figures were raised yes a bit light on detail there was a french magician in paris i believe in 1319 and he specified that he gained his knowledge of magic by travelling in spirit form with, and I quote, good ladies and the souls of the dead. So, one of the earlier texts that does incorporate the idea of 
witches leaving their bodies and also spirits of the dead in the same host. I then also have men brief mention of two magicians who were on trial in Milan in 1370, who also claimed that they'd travelled as part of a spiritual host, which was made up of both living and dead people, and was led by an unnamed supernatural female figure. To those, I can also add a pair of celebrated trials that were held in Milan in 1384 and 1390, in which two women stated that they had gone to the society or game of an individual by the name of Lady Oriente, at which they paid homage to her. And what's interesting to me is that the presiding inquisitor over this trial referred to this figure as Diana or Herodias. So we see the continuation of those figures' association. Was that Inquisitor Fra Beltramino de Cernusculo? It may well be, yes. Because I have a bit of information on that where he refers to this as the Game of Diana. He, I don't have a specific date, just that it's 14th century. Uh, he forced a confession from a woman named Petrina, in which he claims that Petrina travelled in the form of a spirit or an animal with the host which would kill animals and eat their flesh before placing the bones back into the skin, where Diana would then strike the animal's skin with her staff and resurrect the animals. Yeah, that very closely matches the description I have here. So my description indicates that this host was indeed joined by every kind of animal except for the donkey and the fox. And as you said, it feasted on beasts that were then restored to life. One factor I think to add that you don't seem to have there, Crofty, is that this host also visited homes to bless them. And it also includes the detail that uh, this Oriente, who's referred to as Diana or Herodias, instructed her followers in the arts of both herb law and divination. It seems we got information on the same trials from different sources. Yeah. One minor thing to kind of note is we also, as I think as Ronald Hutton points out, we see a little bit of this tradition mixing with the separate tradition of the marching dead at this point. As this testimony that I just mentioned, I believe... Uh, also includes a note that some members of the companies were in fact executed criminals who were shamed by their uh, role in life. One slight thing that I'd like to mention is that Lecuto suggests that the Diana that is mentioned in these various accounts is not in fact the Roman Diana. He references writings of St. Martin of Braga which is in the region of northern Portugal that was formerly part of Galicia, in which he wrote in the 6th century, claiming that the Diana known in Western Europe was in fact a Celtic goddess of the forests, rather than the Roman hunter goddess, and that the name was a Latinization of a goddess alternately named as Dianum or Dianu in Asturias in Spain, and he also thought her to be connected to the Irish goddess Danu. This is quite a tenuous yeah. link, admittedly. On only Lakuto seems to make it, but there are also others that try and make different links to Celtic figures rather than Germanic figures that I'll be discussing later on, so I thought I should mention that at this stage. Yeah, there is quite a lot of work people have done trying to connect uh, various names uh, to the Wild Hunt kind of just on a basic linguistic similarities. Very little of it to me seems to be actually based in direct evidence or accounts. It is very much reconstructive, uh, speculative work. I'd agree there. Um, just some of the figures then became quite prominent later on. Yeah. And that does seem to be based on these kind of tenuous links. So I thought I should introduce that at this stage, if that was okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to, a spoiler warning to everyone listening at home, um, the association with probably the biggest figure with the wild hunt, hunt which is Odin, is equally tenuous. So uh, uh, we're not really going to judge uh, these people because people have been making similar links for a long time. So, Crofty, these beliefs of a company of generally benevolent female spirits continue to persist despite kind of discouragement from Christian sources in a broad zone throughout much of southern Germany the Alps and Italy, well into the 16th and 17th centuries. So I have an example here from 1586 of a figure known as the Shaman of Oberstdorf, who was a man by the name of Conrad Stecklin, who claimed to be a witch hunter himself, 
He actually ended up being tried and executed for witchcraft. And this particular detail that I have that's relevant to this spectral group comes from, I believe, his testimony of his trial in 1586. He was executed the next year. So at his trial, he claimed to have travelled long distances with a group known as the Naktsa, which was the Knight Company. And I thought this was interesting because, according to him, this company consisted of both men and women. This sort of theme is also echoed in the early 17th century by a citizen of Luzern in modern Switzerland who wrote up a chronicle that recorded a belief in the, quote, good army or blessed people who visited favoured and deserving individuals. And it was said that unlike the portent we saw beforehand of where individuals who were living, who were seen to be in this army, saw a portent of their death, instead this army was said to include people who were still alive and their appearance there was considered instead an honour rather than a portent of their doom. That's an interesting one. Mm, it is. I unfortunately did not have a lot of time to go into it, but that is uh, one more interesting interpretation of it. Yeah, it seems to be one of the few positive accounts that to have come out of this after um, Christianization of the legend, really. Well, I have another example of that as well. So one thing that's also pointed to is in the seven, the one thing that's also pointed to as evidence that this belief considered to persist uh, comes from Sicily of all places, which is quite far removed from Germany. There are various other traditions as well. I'm summarizing quite heavily here for time. In Sicily in the 17th century, this belief seems to persist in the form of a group of figures known as the Ladies from Outside. So this consists of small groups of beautiful, fairy-like women, often strangely marked by the distinction of having hands taken from animals. What also interests me is that this group, again, seems to be led by a figure of various names, often referred to as the Queen of the Fairies, but what kind of throws me is I don't see any direct links in the names chosen with previous uh, versions of this myth. So the names I had listed here were Inguanata, Zabella, and Sibylia. Or Sibylla. Sibylla, C-Y-B-E-L-E. Nope, S-I-B-I-L-A. Ah. Because, hmm. yeah, my, my first thought then was um, Sibylla who was an equivalent of Gaia, pre-Greek, in fact. Mm. But that would, that would again be making a very massive linguistic leap with no real... Yeah, <laughs> Sibylla is the goddess of the Phrygians, as far as I'm aware, in the Anatolian Peninsula, which is a pre-Greek mythology period of belief. And that, is, uh, that would be an incredibly tenuous link. Yeah, I mean... The furthest east, I understand she spread, was she made it as far as Rhodes and Crete, um, is my mm. understanding. But again, well, that, Your understanding that was... is off, because she was actually taken into the Roman pantheon at one point. But we're getting yeah. off topic here. <laughs> yes, yeah. we're, we're doing what we've just criticised of making tenuous linguistic links. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> we're not immune to it. <laughs> The last thing to add to this group is that sometimes this figure, this female leader, has a male consort, uh, or simply the group as a whole has a male attendant. And very much in keeping with previous traditions, these figures were known to visit and bless houses, uh, or simply to dance and feast within other houses as well. These figures also do appear in trial records from the late 16th century, from people who claim that they had received such a visit and were promptly informed on to the Inquisition for the offence of claiming to travel with the ladies, which is listed in a Sicilian penitential from the late 15th century. I'm going by uh, Ronald Hutton's claims here. So I think the summary of all that, Crofty, is that there is a widespread body of evidence that there was a belief in a host of supernatural or superhuman women often associated with travelling nocturnally, sometimes with the Christmas season, that ran from the 9th century through to the end of the medieval period and into the early modern period. And as I will discuss a little bit coming forward, many of these beliefs then continued on into later folklore and uh, appear to have had at least some influence over Grimm's depiction of the Wild Hunt and of further depictions and associations of the Wild Hunt by more modern authors.
Okay, Crofty, so that is everything I have in terms of my chronological kind of review of those traditions. What I think we're going to kind of do now is try and go into more depth on the individual regional traditions and major figures who were, had their own body of legends or beliefs, um, some of which associated them with the wild hunt. So we, we actually get into the fun folklore. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Okay, Crofty, so we've kind of divvied these up between us. You you did take France, uh, but we've kind of discussed some of those traditions already uh, along with Spain and that. But I think you're primarily here going to be focusing on beliefs associated with Wild Hunt in Britain and Wales, specifically. Yes, yes. So would you, would you like me to start and then you can move on to uh, the Germanic traditions to bring the episode to a close? Indeed, that, let's, uh, let's go with that then. So I will start with some nice folklore from my adopted country of Wales. Is it do- adopted when you invade and take something over, Crofty? <laughs> Don't say it like that. They might kick me out. Mm. <laughs> so yes, the place that I showed up in and said, right, I'm living here now, if you really want to be pedantic, Charles. <laughs> I'm just the first citizen, I swear. Yes. Mm. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. So, Wales has quite an interesting figure that, for the most part, seems to occur pretty much in isolation. I can only find a few small suggestions at a connection to any other figures outside of Wales. And this is the hero known as Gwyn Ap Need, who became associated with a supernatural hunt and leading a group of spectral hounds. Gwyn was originally part of the retinue of King Arthur. He featured prominently in the tale of Cullock and Olwen, which was an 11th century narrative appearing in the Red Book of Hergest and in the Mabinogion, which I believe we discussed in our King Arthur episode. The middle part of Gwyn's name, Ap, means son of, so Gwyn's father was named Need, and this name, according to an essay in the 1930s by J.R. Tolkien, is a distortion of the name of the Celtic deity Nodens, who was worshipped as a god of healing, god of the sea, hunting, and dogs by the ancient Britons. Yeah, he's he's one of those figures where it's a little difficult to tell because he, again, was kind of taken over and uh, Romanized to some extent. So it's a little difficult to tell how much of his actual Celtic character was preserved there. Exactly. So it's a potential connection to a wider mythology as the son of an of what may be a hunter god, but we can't really confirm anything more than Tolkien's linguistic connection there. Yep, but it means we get to mention Tolkien. Yep, any episode we mention Tolkien is always good. <laughs> yeah, we, doesn't matter how tenuous the claim is, we'll, we'll always jump at that. So. Yeah. <laughs> Another suggestion as to his origins comes from the Welsh folklorist Sir John Rees, writing in his book Celtic Mythology, Welsh and Manx, in which he suggested that Gwyn was a god in his own right, a god of winter, a god of death, and a god of darkness. In his form as a human, he has two main exploits, which feature, like I say, in the narrative of Cullock and Olwen. Firstly, he kidnaps a woman called Craidlad, who was the betrothed of another of King Arthur's knights, Gwythyr ap Gredal. Gwythyr gathers his host to take her back, and assaults Gwyn's stronghold, but Gwyn defeats them. In this battle, Gwyn kills the knight Noithon, and he forces his son... Sorry, Wales. <laughs> he forces his son, Cleodir, to eat his father's heart, which drives him mad. King Arthur, upon hearing of this, summons Gwyn before him. He frees all the nobles that Gwyn had captured, and he forcibly makes peace between Gwyn and Gwythyr. To do so, he makes them agree that Craidlad would remain in her father's house and marry neither of them, and that Gwyn and Gwythyr would fight for her every 1st of May from that day until Judgment Day, and whichever of them should be the final victor would have her. The second main exploit he has is as part of Arthur's hunting party, when Arthur assists Cullock, by hunting for the Turk Troith, which was a prince who had been cursed into the form of a wild boar, 
which I think you told that story in full, I believe, Charles. Yes, I did. Yep. The main important aspect then for this is that the giant is badden tells Kulluk that he can't hunt for the Turk Troith without the aid of Gwynap Need, who contains the nature of the devils in Anun, which is the name for the Welsh Otherworld. So from these references, we have Gwyn as a demigod, or as a full god, who is bound to engage in battle every year for eternity, and who is known as a hunter, both potentially from his parentage, but also from his deeds on earth all of which do cast him as a very fitting leader for the wild hunt. Following the tales in the Mabinogion, he appears in the Black Book of Carmarthen, which is a collection of 13th century manuscripts, and he features in a poem the exchange between Gwyn Ap Need and Gwydno Garanhir. In it, Gwyn is described as the Lord of Hosts, and it says that he has travelled many battles, many deaths, with shields held aloft, many heads pierced by spears. He also specifies that he saw battle at Caerphandu, which is a place that is explicitly described as in the other world by the Welsh poet Taliesin. And towards the end of the poem, Gwyn very explicitly identifies himself as one who escorts the dead to the other world, with several verses in which he names fallen warriors that he's escorted. And so I'll quote here, I was there when Gwendolau was slain, Kedio's son, a pillar of poetry, when ravens croaked on gore. I was there when Bran was slain, Iweridid's son, of wide fame, when battle ravens croaked. I was there when Lyakau was slain, Arthur's son, wondrous in woodcraft, when ravens croaked on gore. I was there when Mierig was slain, Carrion's son, honoured in praise, when ravens croaked on flesh. I was there when Gwalog was slain from a line of princes, grief of the Saxons, son of Lienog. I was there when the warriors of Britain were slain from the east to the north. I live on, they are in the grave. I was there when the warriors of Britain were slain from the east to the south. I live on, they are dead. So that is quite explicitly say, suggesting that he is, he is somehow involved in assisting the dead and aiding the dead. Mm in passing over to the other side, particularly the battle dead. Yeah. That sort of role as a psychopomp, as a, a figure that aids in the transfer of, the, uh, of people from the living to the afterlife, is a fairly common element that you do see with some of the figures who are associated with the wild hunt. So that very much appears in Odin's role as a psychopomp, for example. So part of Odin's role within Norse mythology is that he takes half of the warriors who are slain in battle and takes them to Valhalla to form part of his own host. Mm. But we will get into that. I just, just thought the parallel was interesting to bring up. Yeah, yeah. That's, it. That, that's one of the reasons that later folklorists associate Gwyn with the idea of the Wild Hunt, because mm. of that connection. He does seem to be the only figure in the British Isles that I can find who does have that role, who's associated with the hunt, which is strange, particularly given that... You know, Norse folklore, um, Danish folklore, didn't really have much effect on Wales because the Danes only really got a few small parts of the South Welsh, the South Welsh coast around Swansea, and the Welsh were very territorial and mm. very much kept their own beliefs separate. Yeah, un- unlike the English, where there was much more mingling of yeah of cultures there, so. The poem um, also then specifies, um, after describing Gwyn as a psychopomp, specifies that Gwyn travels with a pack of hounds led by the greatest of hounds, Dormarth, and these hounds are taken to be the Kun Anun, which were the Welsh hellhounds of later folklore. A later um, piece of folklore has a man by the name of Iolo Ap Hugh, who played the traditional Welsh fiddle, the Cruth, encountering Gwyn Ap Need on a misty Halloween night. He trades his cruth for a bugle and becomes the huntsman-in-chief to Gwyn, and it was said that every Halloween night they would hunt together with the Kun Anun over Kader Idris in Snowdonia. And one final story of the hunt in Wales 
which was published in the 19th century, but was thought to be older, has the leader of the Kunanun not explicitly named as Gwyn, but there's some debate over whether he is Gwyn or whether he's the devil himself. And the narrative goes as follows. Ages ago, as a man who had been engaged on business, not the most creditable in the world, was returning in the depth of night across Kefen Craney, and thinking in a downcast frame of mind over what he had been doing, he heard in the distance a low and fear-inspiring bark, then another bark, and another, and then half a dozen and more. Ere long, he became aware that he was being pursued by dogs, and that they were the Kun Anun. He beheld them coming, he tried to flee, but he felt quite powerless and could not escape. Nearer and nearer they came, and he saw the shepherd with them. His face was black, and he had horns on his head. They had come round him and stood in a semicircle, ready to rush upon him, when he had a remarkable deliverance. He remembered that in he, his pocket he had a small cross, which he showed them. They fled in greatest terror in all directions. And this accounts for the proverb, Moinar kithral at igras, any more than the devil to the cross. So, I'll apologise if I butchered that bit of Welsh there. <laughs> but I tried. I think there's a there's a 100% <laughs> chance of that happening. I think I'm getting slightly better. Yeah. yeah well, I mean, you didn't even hesitate with some of those words. Yeah. yeah. Rate me out of 10 in the YouTube comments. <laughs> Half? Yeah. That'll do. <laughs> yeah. So, there's debate over whether that particular figure is Gwen, or whether at this point the folklore has become fully Christianised and replaced the leader of the Kunanun with the devil himself. But I would say that at that point, it's entirely up to the reader's interpretation. And if the figure were Gwyn, it's also quite interesting that this final version gives him horns, because that would suggest that there is some English influence, as we'll see later on that horns or antlers do become associated with the leader of the hunt towards the end. So... Now I will head across the border into England and start with, I think, the first mention of anything that resembles the Wild Hunt in England, which is in the Peterborough Chronicle, a continuation of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, um, which was composed by various monks in Peterborough following the Norman Conquest. It's a short description of a single sighting dated as Sunday the 6th of February 1127, which picks up shortly after the arrival of a new abbot at the monastery, Abbot Henry. Um, and I'll quote it in full, as it's quite a short one again. Let everyone who hears this believe, and let them regard this testimony as true, for it soon became common knowledge throughout the country, that as soon as he arrived there, which was on the Sunday when they sing Exerge Quare O Domine, then immediately afterwards a great number of people saw and heard many hunters hunting. The hunters were dark and huge and ugly, and all their hounds dark and broad-eyed and ugly, and they rode on dark horses and dark stags. This was seen in the Deerfold in the town of Peterborough itself, and in all the woods that led from the same town to Stamford. The monks heard the sound of the horns that they blew in the night. Trustworthy men who were here on watch that night said that, as far as they could judge, there were about twenty or thirty hornblowers. This was seen and heard from the time that Abbot Henry came there throughout Lenten tide to Easter. The author then goes on to discuss that Abbot Henry left the abbey in disgrace about the same time that these hunters disappeared, uh, though I don't have the full details from that. From what I can gather is that he wasted the funds that were intended for rebuilding the abbey. So this hunt, if we take it as the wild hunt, can be interpreted as an omen of Abbot Henry's less than pious intentions, shall we say. Mm. And while the visual description fits an idea of the wild hunt, and I think, in fact, the dark and huge and ugly description matches what you were saying about early Germanic warriors as well, Charles. Yeah. Um, it does seem to be an entirely Christian ghost story that was written as a warning with the evil host being an omen of a person's misdeeds rather than a continuation of any previous wild hunt myth. Yeah, I think um, it does remind me a little bit of Orderic uh, Vitalis's uh, account a little bit, where um, the appearance of the hunt 
is effectively uh, almost like an omen to uh, tell the priest Walshalin to change his sinful ways. But that is that is stretching a little bit, I must admit. Yeah, the, the, the timings do line up. Um, yeah. Being about what, just, over thir- just over 35 years after Walshalin's story. Mm. Although, actually, yeah, you said Vitalis published his in the 1130s, didn't you? Yeah, that is correct. Yeah. So, yeah, the timings roughly line up. Mm. So it is quite possible that this had become a widespread Christian thing that was being used as a warning you know, throughout England and France at this point. Yeah, it is possible. It, it's very speculative, though. So yeah. I think we'll leave it at that. Yeah. In England, probably the most fleshed out myth that's associated with the hunt is the story of King Hurler, which we mentioned briefly in the chronology, which was first written in the late 12th century. Though I don't have an exact date. In the book De Nugis Curialum, which translates as Trinkets for the Court by an author called Walter Mapp. He claims that this comes from earlier folklore, but again, there's not really much evidence to suggest that it came from anywhere apart from his own imagination. But it's an interesting story in its own right. So in this narrative, King Hurler was a king of the ancient Britons. When out riding one day, he encountered a small figure that was no bigger than an ape, and depending on the translation, described as either a dwarf or a pygmy, with a long red beard, a hairy belly, and legs that became goat's feet. By way of introduction, the dwarf said that he was the king of many kings and chiefs, and people numerous beyond count, and after giving Hurler many flattering compliments, he requested the honour of being Hurler's wedding guest, when the king of the French gives his daughter to Hurler, which at this point Hurler knew nothing about. An agreement was made that he should attend Hurler's wedding, and that Hurler would attend his wedding one year later to the day, while the dwarf then swiftly departed. When Hurler returned home, he encountered messengers who were delivering the offer from the king of the French to marry his daughter, and so a wedding was arranged. Before the first course of the wedding feast, the dwarf entered with a great multitude of his fellows, filling all of the tables that Hurler had set out, and then pitching his own pavilions in order to accommodate even more of his people. The dwarf's servants produced vessels and plates of crystal and gold, all worked with precious stones, but nothing of silver or wood, and they provided an endless supply of food so everything that Hurler had prepared was left untouched. The dwarfs also provided wondrous entertainment, waited on the guests hand and foot, and gave Hurler many gifts. Before departing, the dwarf reminded Hurler of the agreement that Hurler would attend the dwarf's wedding one year hence. And so, almost one year later, the dwarf returned, and on the day of his wedding, guided Hurler and his host to a cave in a large cliff. They passed through this cave into a large open space that was lit by many lamps and was filled with dwarfs. Hurler gave rich gifts to the dwarf his wedding, and for three days and three nights they all celebrated. After this, the dwarf escorted Hurler back to the cave entrance, and as they were leaving, the dwarf presented Hurler with even more gifts, Gifts of horses for all of his men, gifts of dogs, hawks, bows, and falconry gear. The final gift the dwarf gave was a small bloodhound, which Hurler was told to carry in arms, and the dwarf said that none of Hurler's company was to dismount from their new horses until the dog should leap down from its bearer. The dwarf then said farewell and return, returned into the cave. Upon leaving the cave, Hurler accosted an old shepherd and asked him for news of his queen by her name. The shepherd replied, My lord, I scarce understand you, since I am a Saxon and thou a Briton. But I have never heard that name, save that she was a queen of the ancient Britons, wife to King Hurler, who is reported to have disappeared into this very cliff. The Saxons, having driven out the natives, have possessed this kingdom for two hundred years. So in shock at hearing that, some of the company dismounted, ignoring the dwarf's warning, and upon touching the ground, they immediately turned to dust, which is a theme that we've heard a few times in previous Mm. episodes. So upon seeing this, 
Hurler forbade anyone's dis- dismount before the dog did so. And Walter Mapp says then that the dog has since never descended. So for several hundred years following this, Walter Mapp says that Hurler has endlessly wandered throughout the country with his army, and he has been seen far and wide until finally, in the year of King Henry II's coronation, many Welshmen saw his host sinking into the River Wye at Hereford, which is near the Welsh border, and from then on their wild march has ceased. So, some folklorists suggest that Hurler's host, which in other writings are referred to as the Hurlathingai, or Hellathingus, which literally means the family Hurler. So some other folklorists suggest that this name is an evolution of the Hurlequin. However, there's not really any intermediate to suggest how, how the kind of ho- host of the damned then became a host of a king that had just entered the other world on an agreement with a dwarf. Yeah, the actual textual difference, differences are so vast because like, you're not actually dealing with a host of the dead anymore. As you say, it's like a cautionary tale about making deals rather than anything else. Hmm. That seems a stretch to me. Yeah. You've got the basically, you've got a mounted host and a leader there. Exactly. And also it's, it's only about 70 or so years after the, actually no. No, it's it's actually before the last references to the Heliquin as well. Yeah, so uh, very, very, very tenuous uh, association. Yeah, it's a bit tenuous. Um, another folklorist, um, Priscilla Kershaw, suggests that the name is actually a Saxon name that is descended from the name Herala Kynig, or Sinig. I'm a bit unsure yeah. of the pronunciation there. Yeah, I think we discussed this briefly beforehand where I mentioned there's various Germanic words associated with king, uh, which Sinig and uh, Konig are a couple. Mm. I probably pronounced both of those wrong myself, <laughs> I apologise. And that would make some sense in terms of the etymology of the name, although it would probably be most sensible to assume that a Saxon name was just given to an original character rather than descending from someone specific. Yeah. There have also been suggestions that the name of Hurler then went on to become the name of Earl King in Van Goeth's poem, The Earl King. But again, that's just an interesting bit of speculation. And one final potentially tenuous connection that was made to King Hurler is that the narrative itself is quite similar to a Welsh story called the Predu Anun, or Spoils of the Underworld, which also appears in the Mabinogion. I believe that's, uh, again, one of the early, men- early uh, starring roles of Arthur. Yeah, but um, I can't really comment on whether there's anything substantial there to connect the two. So I'll just mm. leave those as potential connections, but I can't say which of them, if any, are accurate. We have a few other local figures that are just interesting folklore and actually seem to just be local word-of-mouth tales that yeah. have eventually been written down in the 20th century and I found on the internet just, you know, hobbyists collecting these stories by the, by the sound of it. Yeah, that, w- that wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, so if I can go into them just briefly, because they're, they're interesting, and I, but I can't really make any connections to anything else there. Uh, so one of them, collected by a website called Folk Horror Revival, talks of the story of Wild Edric, which is localised to the county of Shropshire, which is near the Welsh border. Wild Edric was a disgraced Saxon lord who initially fought alongside the Welsh against William the Conqueror before becoming an outlaw after William's victory, and in 1070 surrendered to William, giving him fealty in exchange for his freedom and a small manor, with his Shropshire holdings being given to Norman lords. The supposed folklore around this however, says that prior to the arrival of William the Conqueror, Edric had encountered a fairy princess named Godda when he was lost in the forest. He asked her to marry him, and she agreed as long as she could visit her sisters in the forest as often as she liked and for as long as she liked. In this version, William the Conqueror actually negotiated a peace with Edric because he wished to see Godda's otherworldly beauty. 
and after meeting her, he said it would be shameful to rob her of her husband. After several years of marriage, Edric then once rebuked Godda for spending so long with her sisters in the forest. She vanished, and Edric, a few years later, died in despair after searching for her the rest of his life. And for his sins of submitting to William and of rebuking his wife, the fairies then locked him in the ancient lead mines at the town of Snail Beach, and to remain there until all the Normans had been expelled from the land. And he is only released on the eve of battle, where he musters the Fae and long dead warriors for the hunt, which he leads through the county of Shropshire. And this has supposedly been seen before the Crimean War, before the Napoleonic Wars, before the Boer Wars, and before World Wars I and II. Another local legend found on, on a website collecting ghosts and legends of the Lower Calder Valley in the north of England, and is also mentioned in a 1964 paper called Ghost Riders in the Sky by one Susan Hillary Houston, is a legend known either as the Gabble Ratchets or Gabriel Ratchet or the Gabriel Hounds. It's quite similar to the Kun Anun. It's first recorded in 1664 by the Reverend Oliver Haywood. He'd recently moved to the Calder Valley and he wrote, There's a strange noise in the air, heard in many parts this winter, called the Gabriel Ratches by this country people. The noise is as if a great number of whelps were barking and howling, and it is observed that if any sees them, sees them, persons that should see them die shortly after. They are never heard but before a great death or death, though I have never heard them. And this appeared through the north of England as late as 1879. So, finally, for this section on England, we come to possibly the most famous figure associated with the English wild hunt, and that is Hearn the Hunter. Jacob Grimm was the first one to describe him as the leader of the wild hunt, and from this it spread through popular consciousness and has endured even to modern depictions. For example, earlier on I referenced um, the Dresden Files series, where the wild hunt is led by a fairy with the title of Earl King. Some of this Earl King's vassals address him as Lord Hearn. Hearn also appears leading a supernatural hunt in the TV series Robin of Sherwood. He leads the wild hunt in Susan Cooper's The Dark is Rising novels and appears as part of the wild hunt in the Hellboy comics. However, prior to Jacob Grimm's book, there are only two written records of Hearn. The first is a short passage in Shakespeare's The Merry Wives of Windsor, Act 4, Scene 4, which says, There is an old tale that goes, Hearn the Hunter, sometimes a keeper here in Windsor Forest, doth all the winter time and still at midnight walk round an oak with great ragged horns, and there he blasts the tree and takes the cattle and makes the milk kine yield blood and shakes a chain in a most hideous and dreadful manner. You have heard of such a spirit, and well you know the superstitious idle-headed eld received and did deliver to our age this tale of Hearn the Hunter for a truth. That's all that Shakespeare says on him, and the first record we have of him anywhere. The next written reference is a single sentence from 1792 by the writer and engraver Samuel Ireland, which was in a caption to one of his picturesque views on the River Thames, and it simply states, The story of this hern, who was keeper in the forest at the time of Elizabeth, runs thus, that having committed some great offence, which he feared to lose his situation and fall into disgrace, he was induced to hang himself on this tree. Samuel Ireland himself is very much not a reliable source, as he was the man who announced the discovery of a trove of lost Shakespeare manuscripts that Ooh. were l later revealed to be forgeries made by his son, William Henry Ireland. And following Grimm's publication of Deutsche Mythology, the next reference is then an 1843 novel called Windsor Castle by William Harrison Ainsworth. So pretty much entirely fictional accounts of, of Hearn here. Nothing in terms of written folklore or any records of him. It seems to be entirely Jacob Grimm's creation that he was the leader of the wild hunt 
in later academia, the Professor R. Lowe Thompson in the 1920s claims that the name of Hearn is a derivative of Kernanos, the horned god of Celtic mythology, and that the antlered depiction supports this. But that is again a connection based entirely on the similarities of the name with Kern, yeah. Kern part of Kernanos meaning horn, the aspects of Kernanos as a god of the dead don't really line up with any particular aspects of Hearn. And there's also a thousand year gap with no intermediaries at all. Yeah, not to be too dismissive of that theory, but that's the, uh, I got a hunch level of uh, evidence that we're talking about there. Yeah, yeah. Sounds a bit similar. Yeah, basically I knew of this theory prior to all of this, and I, I was under the impression that there was an actual there was an actual progression between Kernanos and Hearn. And so I, I actually wanted to be able to tell the story of how we have this, this Celtic horned god of the forests and how we then see it progress over about a thousand years to this English figure of folklore. That was the episode that I really wanted to make. And that was not what we got. <laughs> that was not what we got. So yes, that's the major British traditions associated with the hunt. We get scattered mentions of other names. The Irish hero Finn McCool is sometimes claimed to lead a hunt of Irish she fairies. There's other tales of ghostly hounds compiled by the 19th century author William Henderson. There's mentions of Sir Francis Drake leading the hunt in Dartmoor. And even a mention of a 17th century Cornish lawyer called Jan Tregeagle, leading the hunt after he died. But I have no sources to back up any of those claims. And so with that, I think it's time to hand over to you, Charles, to discuss Odin for the final segment of this episode. Okay, thank you, Crofty. I was going to say, your list was uh, a lot more varied than mine. And uh, it may be, whilst there are several other figures of mythology and folklore that are associated with the wild hunt, in Germany and Scandinavia. The real meat of the discussion there is dominated by one figure in particular, so that may be why there are, I have fewer examples to give here. Um, and I think most people know who I'm referring to. We've referred to him multiple times so far. Before I get to Odin, however, I wanted to have a quick look through some of the other figures, that, as we mentioned before, uh, and a little look through the chronology of how some of these beliefs um, changed over time. I wanted to have a look at some of these figures and see if there's anything interesting there. One of the figures which is most commonly associated with the wild hunt is Frau Hall, or Holder, uh, who I'm not going to go into in great detail at all here for the simple reason that we discussed her in our Baba Yaga episode. If you want to have a listen to that, you can go back and see her major characteristics. There's not a huge amount in there that really links her to the wild hunt. It's more this spiritual possession, and then she takes on further attributes over time as well. And I have a little bit of a theory as to why that might be coming up in a minute. The one figure I do want to talk a little bit about, though, is Frau Perchter. And for the simple reason that Crofty, I think she's an interesting figure. We didn't really get onto her in our Baba Yaga discussion. And given that we've already done that episode and we've now mostly done this episode, I don't think we're going to have many other opportunities to ever really talk about her again. So I thought I'd just give her a little bit of a starring role here. Yeah, that's where I'd like to hear this. Frau Perchter is frequently seen as kind of a, the southern variant of Frau Hall. Some of her kind of distinguishing features from Frau Hall that I thought would be interesting to go into here, though, are that she basically appears to be a figure who is very much associated with the Feast of the Epiphany and with the Twelfth Night of Christmas. As a result of this, she is also considered largely equivalent to a folkloric figure in Italy, known as La Befana. Most of my information regarding her comes from the work of John B. Smith's 2004 article, which is Perched Her, the Belly Slitter and Her Kin, A View of Some Traditional Threatening Figures, Threats and Punishments. And uh, that title there gives away one of her major characteristics. So I'll quickly just wrap up the figure of La Befana in Italy. She is mostly known for being a figure who, you know, very similar to uh, Santa Claus and his associated myths, visits children, not on Christmas, but on the final night 
of the 12 days of Christmas, the night between the 5th and the 6th of January. If the children have been good, she rewards them with candy, and if not, she gives the stereotypical lump of coal. And much like Labifana, Perchta is said to be at large during the 12th night of Christmas. Her most distinguishing feature is a feature that she holds in common with Frau Hall and with Babiago, as we discussed, which is her long or even iron nose. She additionally rides in a carriage, and in later traditions rides on a plough, which is somewhat similar to the reappropriation of a mundane item in the form, for example, of Baba Yaga's pestle and mortar. Alongside these characteristics, she is also known to be accompanied by a host of unbaptized children, which to some extent seems to be a cautionary tale aimed towards people who do not have their children baptized. And she also is known, as I mentioned before, by the nickname of the belly slitter. And this is due to her habit of slitting up people who break various societal taboos and then filling their stomachs with rubbish. So these offences kind of fall into a few different categories. The main categories are if you fail to eat the correct foods or the correct amount of foods on a, on the Feast of Epiphany, then you will be the victim of her wrath. In fact, one of the legends I saw mentioned in this article was that the whole point of filling your stomach at the Epiphany was that if your stomach was full, her knife would bounce off it. Hmm. So one of these strange situations where a feast and kind of gluttony and indulgence is seen in a positive light, and it may be uh, kind of a celebration of plenty and seen as an appropriate appreciation of uh, this repast that is given to you. She's also known to enforce a number of taboos associated with spinning wheels on certain rest days, including the uh, the tradition of the Ember Days of Christianity. There are a couple of tales from that article that did include elements of spinning, so let me pull up my example I have here. Okay, so this story comes from 1867, and it concerns a manifestation of Perkta known as Frau Berta, or Frau Berta, and it says the following. In Ronshi, in the southern Tyrol, there once came a knock on the door of a house where twelve women were spinning. There stood Frau Berta, whom the woman addressed as follows. Greetings to you, Frau Berta, with a long nose. Frau Berta answered, Behind me is one with a still longer nose. In the end there were twelve Frau Bertas, each with a nose longer than her predecessors, and they sat down on the chairs that the women had meanwhile vacated. When the Frau Bertas demanded buckets to fetch water in, the women knew they were in danger of being boiled alive. Instead of bringing buckets, they were therefore brought baskets, in which the Frau Bertas would be unable to carry water from the river. The women then quickly went home and got into bed with their husbands, whereupon no harm could overtake them. And then, in addition to this, I also have a story, I think it comes from 1927. It basically is a cautionary tale that women should refrain from spinning and related tasks during the Ember Days in December. So it says the following. In Fiestritz, a woman who was preparing to boil and scald her skeins, I assume skins, was visited by another woman, a stranger who offered to help. On going to a neighbour's to borrow a seething tub, the first woman was warned not to return home, since it was Ember Friday, and her strange visitor might be the Quautemberka. Sure enough, the stranger then appeared at the window of the neighbour's house, saying, Lucky for you that you didn't come back home with the tub. Had you forgotten that today is Ember Friday, and to boil the skeins, I would have boiled you. So that boiling motif is quite similar to uh, Baba Yaga's intentions of how she in, is going to consume her victims in many of the stories we discussed in that relevant episode. Yeah, the thing of not being able to carry the water in certain vessels. I think that did come up mm. in Baba Yaga. It was one of the ways of tricking yep. her. But my memory's a bit rusty. Yeah, it's been a while, unfortunately. There are, however, um, examples of her being a far more generous force. And... She's more presented really as an enforcer of societal taboos rather than an evil entity. And she will often reward those who observe her correctly and show her generosity. So a good example of this is a story that I also took from that article called Pershed and the Farmhand. And it says that Pershed was on a journey with her company of children who had died unbaptized. The way was uneven and her carriage lost a wheel. 
Arriving on the scene, a farmhand was asked for help, and he saw that a linchpin had been broken. He put the wheel back and secured it with a new linchpin, which he carved from a piece of wood. Persh commanded him to keep the shavings as a reward, and, afraid to refuse, he put a few in his pocket, and they turned into gold. So yeah, an example then of, again, someone to Baba Yaga as having a more generous side to her. And I just wanted to say that um, Jacob Grimm and Scholar Sinsim have indeed equated her origins to various pagan goddesses, uh, either a purely Germanic one or the Scandinavian goddess Frigg, who is known for being Odin's wife. Jacob Grimm, however, admits there is no clear evidence of her existence prior to the 14th century, as we documented in the chronological section. And according to the same article I mentioned by John B. Smith, an argument that better syncs up with her known appearances is that she and related figures such as Frau Fast and Frau Holt may originate more as personifications of certain Christian feast days that then over time may have acquired associations with earlier traditions such as the good ladies and the spirit's host and her more general motifs and characteristics are more similar to things like Baba Yaga. Hmm. And again, we're uncertain of Baba Yaga's exact origins beyond kind of the 17th, 18th centuries. But that's kind of the limit of really of her association with the wild hunt is her appearing with this host of children, travelling in a carriage. And there doesn't seem to be that much more really to link her to the uh, the construct. So in addition to Perchter, there are another of common figures associated with the wild hunt within Germany that I just want to quickly go through and uh, in Scandinavia. So these include a couple of historical figures, which are King Vladimir IV of Denmark, who is also known as Vladimir Atadag, who, through the very brief references I found for him, he appears to have been associated with this literature in the 19th century, uh, mostly in association with um, various uh, developments in Danish nationalism, uh, associated with its contentions with Germany in various wars over the uh, region of what was it called? Holstein, Schleswig, something like that. Hmm. So I haven't gone much more further into that. But he is another example of a historical figure such as Charles V, who has then been co-opted into the myth. Uh, Charles V of France. In addition to this, another figure who is occasionally said to be associated with the Wild Hunt is the Ostrogothic King Theodoric the Great, who is best known as King of the Ostrogoths, who migrated into Italy in the late 5th century and uh, he proceeded to take over the Italian peninsula from uh, his previous ruler, who was a chieftain by the name of Odosa, or Odoasa, I believe, who had previously deposed the last Western Roman emperor. So Theodoric is largely connected to the Wild Hunt, not in his historical personage, but through his mythological derivative, which was the figure known as Dietrich von Bern. So Dietrich is a later myth that I think appears from the 9th century onwards that basically is presented as a king who rules from Verona in Bern who is essentially deposed by his evil uncle Ermenric and also the Huns under a figure known as Edzil uh, which I believe is no name for Attila the Hun if I'm correct. Hmm. However Dietrich von Bern is a very complex and highly developed figure with his own mythology. He appears alongside many of the same legends as figures such as Siegfried Pirin. He appears in the, the Nibel Lungen, oh, how's it said again? The Nibel Lungen Lied and various forms of medieval German literature. And I honestly feel like he may be a figure that we want to reserve to do a full episode on again because he has an incredibly long standing body of oral tradition and effectively his own group of mythological deeds. So, he is in some folkloric discussions of the Wild Hunt, associated as one of its potential leaders, but we're going to leave that there for today. Yeah, it's definitely one to cover in future. It is. I think what we might do is we may combine discussion of him alongside discussion of heroes such as Siegfried, also known as uh, Sigurd, of Germanic heroic myth. Okay, so with those kind of out of the way, I'm coming to our last figure associated with Wild Hunt, and by far the largest of these figures, and this is Woden, under either his Nordic name, as I've just mentioned, or his Germanic name of Wotan, 
or Wodan, which are also associated with early Anglo-Saxons as well. Again, we're probably going to do an episode either specifically on Norse mythology. We may even end up doing a whole episode of some form on Odin himself, for all we know. And that association isn't really what I want to focus on here because a lot of the evidence for the association of Odin with the Wild Hunt is not linked to the initial Norse sagas and Germanic myth that he appears in. But for anyone here who is not particularly familiar with him, I wanted to give you guys a quick primer on him and some elements of him that could be seen to contain some elements of the Wild Hunt if given a very generous degree of interpretation. So in the Norse sagas, uh, in sources such as the Prose and the Verse Edda, Odin is the king of the Aesir, which is one of two major tribes of the gods. He is the husband of the goddess Frigg, and he is the father of many gods, including most famously the gods Thor and Balder. In iconographic tradition, he is frequently depicted as a long-bearded man, often with one eye, and leading on a spear, known as Gungnir. Often he is accompanied by two ravens, Hugin, or Fort, and Munin, memory or mind. And these two ravens bring him information from all over Midgard. In addition to this, he is accompanied by two wolves named Geri and Freki, and he rides the eight-legged steed of Slipnir across the sky and the underworld. I mispronounced that last one horribly there. Slipnir I, is the closest I think I'm going to get. I think we should just retitle this podcast Myth Pronunciation. Yeah, Myth Pronunciation. Yes. But um, Yes. Yeah. Carry on. <laughs> And it should probably be noted that in the Norse sagas, he usually is presented in the form of a lone wanderer who often appears in disguise, uh, wearing a long cloak and a broad hat. In terms of the actual Nordic myth, probably the closest similarity between Odin and these sources and Jacob Grimm's later construct of the Wild Hunt is his association with the Einhejar, which is a group of 800 warriors slain in battle who had been brought by the Valkyries to Valhalla. So this group remains in Valhalla until Ragnarok, where they feast daily on the meat of the great boar, Seyrimnir, who is cooked and eaten each day, then made whole again in the evening. They also sup mead that comes from the goat Hadron, who is able to produce mead by eating from the magnificent tree Lyrad. For entertainment, this host dons its battle gear each day and goes out into the courtyard of Valhalla, where they battle each other for sport. And probably the most significant role that these figures kind of play within wider Norse mythology is that they are destined to follow Odin to the Battle of Ragnarok uh, in his contention and eventual consumption by the monstrous wolf Fenrir, child of Loki. This death, however, will be avenged by his son, whose name I cannot pronounce, uh, Vidmar, Vidar, who it is said will tear apart the beast's jaws and kill it by stabbing it in the heart with a spear. Over the last century, there has been a fairly serious argument amongst many folklorists that Odin's association with the Wild Hunt was actually due to the survival of a cultic group of warriors throughout medieval times, and that the folkloric manifestation of the hunt was rooted in rites that were performed by this group. So another strain that's often pointed to as evidence for this is Tacitus's mentions of the Hari that we discussed before. And also there have been some claims of connections with the more historical group of the Norse berserkers, who themselves held a reverence for Odin. The problem with these myths is there doesn't actually seem to be any such evidence of a cult that continues on amongst the peoples of Germany and Scandinavia until the earliest appearance of folklore that goes on to connect Odin in his guise of Wotan or Woden to the Wild Hunt. And also, the earliest folklore is very different in terms of how it associates Odin with this tradition. It does not initially refer to any sort of host. This idea has also lost some credibility because it's associated with a folklorist and academic by the name of Otto Hoffler, who is a German scholar who has, has kind of been largely discredited due to his, uh, and I'm being cagey here for YouTube uh, monetization reason, reasons, uh, 
who was discredited due to his close involvement with, let's just call them, a certain German political movement that ruled Germany between 1933 and 1945. And as a result, his works have been viewed in varying lights. There are people who defend his actual academic works and will claim that he, uh, these are free of his uh, association with that certain group. There are, on the flip side, however, authors and scholars such as Jan Hirschbiegel, uh, Wolfgang Beringer, and Klaus von C, who argue that his work was way less about academic knowledge and more about finding an ideological foundation for that particular group and state that he was associated with, and also a certain organization which he was a member of at one point, which is referred to often with two S's. And yeah, there's a lot of problems with that particular. Uh, theory. The reasoning a lot of this argument relies on is pre actually pretty well summed up by Cla uh, Claude uh, Lecato himself. I know we've criticised uh, his presentation of the myth uh, in his book that we mentioned before, but when it comes to this one in particular, he has a very good take on it, and I have to give him credit. He says, quote, although many German researchers have long shown that the incorporation of the leader of the wild hunt into Odin rests on flimsy foundations, these reasonable voices have gone unheard because they contradict a general tendency to discover mythological survivals in folk traditions, cost what it may. So yes, um, Jacob Grimm's belief really that the Mesne Harlequin or the Furious Army, that their leader was really a denatured form of Odin that had basically been stripped of any of his positive attributes by Christianity, that idea has largely been abandoned by scholars. But there are some interesting elements of folklore through which his name appears to have then later on been connected with the Wild Hunt. And as we said, has very little to do with the Old Norse sagas or Germanic tradition, and it appears to originate in the 16th century. So the first known direct linkage of Odin's name with the Wild Hunt comes from the 16th century in the form of Nicholas Grisser's Mirror of Anti-Christian Papacy and Lutheran Christianity which print was printed in 1593. So in this work, he criticizes local rites that were intended to petition, quote, the false god Odin for a good harvest this year. To quote again, this idolatry persisted under the papacy among many peasants in the form of superstitious customs and invocations of Odin at the harvest time, for the pagans believed that this same diabolical huntsman made his presence known in the fields at the time of the harvest. So it should be noted that this initial tradition only really points to Odin as a singular huntsman, as we've mentioned uh, various other examples of in the course of this episode. He's also mentioned here under the name of Woden, but Odin in Norse mythology and here has many different, very many different names. In fact, he is known for having over a hundred names, so that's not particularly surprising. So in the 17th century, we see more associations of Odin with the wild hunt. In 1654, Johannes Losenius tells us in his volume on Swebo Gotland Antiquities that the Norse made Odin the god of war, and that there is a widespread superstition that whenever a spectre is seen either evening or night, or armed and accompanied by a loud din, people say that it is Odin passing through. This account is noticeable in that it associates Odin with the words spectre and din, which, as I've mentioned a little way back, these terms during this period in Germany were increasingly associated with the Furious Army. And as we continue on to the 17th century, these connections between Odin and this group continue. Much of these initial connections seem to have been done on a kind of philological basis, like a linguistic basis, and rely on drawing links between Odin's name and the name of the Furious Army. So the philologist Johannes Schäffers recycles much of Losenius's work and expands on it, and specifically he uses it to point to the idea that Odin means the word tumult or din, and these are also terms that are associated with the Furious Army. And it's really based on these terms that he then goes on to equate the army simply to Odin and his minions. It should be noted, however, that this link, um, which seems to actually form the main basis of which Odin and the Wild Hunter are associated, is not correct. So based on proto-Germanic reconstructions, it seems that Odin means something more akin to uh, 
possessed or fury. I think I think one interpretation I saw, saw was of the possessed, and this comes from the association with the Proto-Germanic word of Wotaz. So this is really the major link between him and the Wild Hunt, and it seems to be based on a misconception. Future authors kind of take this link and run with it. Um, the tradition also becomes more demonized over time by Christian authors in the in a continuing example that we've seen throughout this episode, and it's really through their um, protestations that it really then begins to merge back into popular folklore. So in the 17th century, the deacon of St. Mary's Church, Christoph Arnold, penned an attack on the idols of, quote, the ancient Saxons and Germans, in which he singles out Odin. And he points out more correctly the connections between his name and the word Wooten, meaning inspires rage, along with the Danish and runic Vod, meaning destruction. And uh, he specifically points to reports that the Icelanders named him as a devil in their expressions. He does describe Lysenius' report, and he adds to this also descriptions of rights amongst the Samai people, largely distributed through areas such as Finland, uh, that take place at Christmas. So again, got linking with uh, Odin with Christmas, as some of their elements of the Wild Hunt have been. And he also adds that in these regions, spirits known as the Julak Volka travelled through the air, and that small statues were erected in their honour. In the mid-18th century, Johann Peter Schmidt, who was professor at the University of Rostock, at northern Germany, wrote the following in a 1742 book, whose name I'm not going to include here because I did go away and look it up. I'm working from a lot of um, Lekato's summary for this. I did go away and look up the exact name, and I found out the book's name is literally like a paragraph long. So I apologise for my laziness in not reading out the whole thing. Is it made up of all those German words where it's just a lot of smaller words just clumped together? Um, possibly. I, the, <laughs> phrase, the thing it reminds me a little bit is, I think, what was the famous statement of Frederick II, who I think he criticised German by saying one of his major complaints was that you have to get all the way to the end of a sentence before you know what its subject is. <laughs> and uh, that's probably not relevant here, but it just put me in that mind. <laughs> Mm. Uh, I of course love German even though I don't speak it it's a beautiful language mm. the exact quote I have here from that book is quote it is said in particular that this younger Odin was an arch magician and had no peer in the arts of making war this is why some people have sought to see his name Woden as a derivative of to rage or Wooten further no one is unaware of the senseless belief held by countless folk especially some hunters the time around Christmas and the eve of Carnival, Bastella Bend, is when the one called Wur, or the Gore, or the Wild Huntsman passes. They say that the devil organises a hunt with a troop of rapping spirits. If we get to the bottom of this superstition, we see it emerge from the story of this younger Odin, and that the common man thinks that Odin, or Wotan, passes. This is why a company of ghosts like this is sometimes called the Furious Army, Wotan or Odin's Army, Guden's Army, or the army of Odin. Quite similar to Jacob Grimm, Schmidt then goes on to make some rather bold comparisons of different folklore beliefs throughout Germanic countries to support the idea that these are really vestiges of paganism. How accurate his reports there are is up to some interpretation, so he, he cites the presence of names such as Odin, Odin, Godin, Wudin, Wodan and Wotan. He doesn't seem to be aware, however, that one of the names in the form of Gore he included is probably a woman's name. <laughs> so, yeah. Now, I have one very quick sentence from uh, Lekker 2, which says that in Denmark, Odin was incorporated into the Wild Huntsman body of myths around the 18th century and appeared for the first time in the writings of the priest Frederick Monrad. Um, I unfortunately was not able to verify this. So, the transmission then of these kind of scholarly concerns back into popular consciousness was, according to Lekato, very much aided by the emerging nationwide press of the 18th and 19th century. So he gives a couple of examples of this. In May of 1832, a professor from the centre of Rostock in northern Germany, by the name of Flork, writes the following in the Fremi Mufiges Abendblatt, or the evening paper. And here is what he says. When I speak about these apparitions and phenomena that are entirely based on the natural order, that are attributed to supernatural causes, 
I immediately think of the Wild Hunt, also called the Furious Army, and the war in Mecklenburg, about which I heard so many terrifying things in my youth and later. Our agrarian labourers, who seek to profit from the cool of the evening air to bind the rye, were so terrified by the Wild Hunt, they would barely dare go into the fields, shivering all the while. First they heard the baying of hounds, which then mingled with the fairly harsh voices of men, and others that were fairly sweet. They saw fires that passed rapidly through the air. Then, if they did not flee, an entire army paraded before them in a terrifying din, made up of barking, instruments that sounded like hunting horns and panting. In my childhood, it was self-evident that these were ancient brigand knights who found no rest in the grave, and who, to amuse themselves, went hunting with their dogs in the world above, as they were accustomed to doing so while alive. A pious preacher has since told me there was nothing other than the devil himself, accompanied by several fallen angels, who took pleasure in frightening people. The devil, he said, took the form of Wotan, the old pagan eagle, in which guise he had been worshipped in earlier times. The name Wall comes from him, and it is a defamation of Wotan. And uh, Legatu asserts that this last claim has no philological basis whatsoever. And then, in addition, in October of 1832, the same paper reports a similar event by F.G.C. Pogue, who is an inhabitant of Ziefsdorf, a village of Mecklenburg, where he states that farm workers who had already loaded several carts of rye, when they suddenly heard, quote, Here comes the war. All the binders dropped their tools and hid inside haystacks, but several old labourers did not budge. Grabbing hold of his courage with both hands, Pogue remained with them. And here is his story. The noise was still far away and resembled that made by a baying pack on the hunt in the forest at a fair distance. The phenomenon gradually grew closer and we could clearly hear the galloping and commotion quite similar to that made by an impetuous charge of many dogs, perhaps more than a hundred, with voices that were both rough and sweet. The company slowly passed by, high in the air, making a racket just a short distance from where we were. Although the moon was shining with sharp clarity, we could see nothing, yet we could distinctly make out the different voices of the dogs that were moving past as it seemed in the upper layers of the air. Little by little, the binders and the children came out of the haystacks. Some of them held their hands over their ears and pressed their faces into the straw, and the saw and heard nothing. Others claimed they had seen fiery blocks in the sky, and according to the testimony of some old people, things like were seen during such manifestations. This time, however, was simply an illusion, for none of those who followed the phenomenon from beginning to end had seen anything other than what I saw. The troop travelled from east to west, and the folk stated that it was the devil of the east with his hunt. That really takes us up to the period where Jacob Grimm himself was compiling his legends, and it's likely that legends similar to this, associating Odin with the wild hunt, really lie behind the genesis of his later modern construct of the wild hunt. Okay, Crofty, so that's everything I have. So I think, then, that about brings the episode to a close. Indeed it does. I'm slightly surprised, because I thought we'd be here for over three hours for once, but when we cut <laughs> out all the dead air and us being generally rubbish at talking, uh, which <laughs> is probably more than we actually cut out, but anyway, it's probably going to be about two and a half hours, I reckon. Yeah, we've managed to summarise everything in a shorter time than I thought, given just how massively scattered every bit of mythology we could find was. There was difficult to find any rhyme or reason to a lot of this. Yes, folks, we apologise if uh, we were jumping out about quite a lot as a result from uh, topic to topic and various different belief structures that all kind of fall within this later kind of umbrella structure of the Wild Hunt. But that really is the state of the stories as far as we can tell in the folklore. It is a very disparate body that seems to have been pushed down into a more defined mould uh, in the 19th mm. century. The thought that struck me while working on my research for this was that the myth that we were actually going to tell is the idea that the Wild Hunt was a myth in itself. Well, you can't say it better than that for an ending. <laughs> so uh, we discovered a myth, just not the one we were expecting. Yep. <laughs> All right, folks, thank you very much for uh, giving this a listen. If you stuck with it for two and a half whole hours, woof. well done. Get yourself a drink. <laughs> exactly. I'm definitely going to go and get myself a drink. So, folks, before we leave you today, we would just like to say if you would like to support the channel 
a little bit further and the show so we can keep churning out these uh, absolute disaster pieces of uh, two and a half hour podcasts on a regular basis you can always head over to patreon.com slash the histocrat where i'm taking any funds uh, and kind donations people give and funding them back into the channel itself and uh, allow us to fund various pieces of artwork associated with the channel and just generally acquire our reading materials that we're going to be using for composing these episodes. In addition to this, um, you can also follow me over on Twitter because, I don't know, that seems important to me for some reason, over at twitter.com slash the underscore histocrat. I do occasionally give updates as to what's happening in terms of planning next episodes and uh, just generally like some more information around the various mythologies associated with these episodes. So Crofty, before we leave today, do we want to give a bit of a hint as to where we're heading over for our next episode? Uh, yes, if you'd like. We're going to be heading into England. We're going to actually be st- sticking with a single figure again. So hopefully a bit of a more coherent yes. <laughs> story this time. What else could I say? I don't want to give too much away. <laughs> that's my little hint there for anyone who recognizes where that came from (laughs) all right folks thank you for listening we'll see you hopefully sooner than last time any last words crofty just thank you and good night (laughs) Mm. thank you folks and goodbye